All righty, perfect. Thanks, Jesse. Welcome, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining today's NGINX workshop focused uh, geared towards the Air Force. It's a U.S. Air Force edition. I'm Nick Strader with One Technology. I'm our federal practice leader. One Technology is an F5 NGINX partner focused on data center application modernization as well as cloud enablement. So for today, I'll briefly run through our agenda, a few housekeeping items, and I'm going to hand it off, hand it back to Jesse from the NGINX team. So the first hour is going to be de dedicated towards an NGINX overview, an introduction of other technologies you're going to come across throughout this workshop. Hour two is going to be a demonstration of the lab environment and architecture. And right around 2.30, we'll start the hands-on lab portion, allow you guys to get down and dirty on the technology. In terms of housekeeping items, all lines will be muted. So take advantage of the chat feature for any questions. We'll also have a breakout room for more in-depth sidebar conversations that will be monitored by Jesse and Dominic from the NGINX team. And if there's any, any topics we don't hit on today, feel free to let us know, myself, the One Tech team, as well as Eddie, Dustin, uh, Jackson Wrigley, and Jesse from the NGINX F5 team. We'll gladly take time. We could set up additional hands-on sessions for you and your teams. And uh, just a reminder, today's session will be, re will be recorded. We'll send out the link afterwards. And we want to thank everyone for taking time out of your busy day to participate in this workshop. We hope you guys find value in today's session. And uh, without further ado, I'll hand it off to Jesse. He'll kick it off from the NGINX team. Take it away, Jesse. Thanks, Nick. Perfect. Um, so, yeah, my name is Jesse Goodyear. I'm an SE at NGINX F5. And just to give you a little bit of agenda today, uh, again, quick overview on NGINX, not trying to give you any marketing materials, but we do want to level set as um, I'm sure there's some people that are relatively new to NGINX on the call. Uh, go into a little bit what that looks like in an F5 environment for people that already have big IP in their infrastructure. And then the real value, I'd say, is going into a demo of the solution in general in our UDF environment and then hand it over to you guys to uh, run through it yourself. The, expect the, about an hour of the overview and then demo, which I would highly recommend so you're not lost <laughs> when it comes to going through the lab. A feedback I've gotten in the past is without the uh, background before you go to the lab, it's, you're not sure exactly what the um, goals of the, you know, the workshop are. So with that, I'll move on. Um, one more thing, you will, or you should have gotten an email from UDF at F5. It's our universal demo framework. And that is what we'll be using for the hands-on portion. Um, there's a password in there and you'll have to reset it on the first use. If you ever do a UDF uh, lab again, it will be the same password that you set right now. Um, so keep that in your password managers if you have one. And if you d did not get an email from us yet, please um, send your email in the chat window to all panelists and we will add you in during this time. It, you'll get it within a couple of minutes. So there's no, no urgency quite yet. All right, so good. Little background um, on NGINX. And so we, we're open source, we are open source the company, uh, or excuse me, the software first went live on, in 2004. The reason it was created was because the web server at the time, Apache, it was a few others, so had some market share, uh, really couldn't scale. And whenever all the, all the websites were, you know, ramping up at the time, as we still are today, uh, you know, before the era of virtualization, it meant that uh, every time your website did better, you needed to buy more hardware. It became very expensive. Uh, so our founder created this software that was much more scalable in terms of concurrent connections. And it was the first thing that could handle uh, 10,000 concurrent connections, which we call the C10K. If you read about it online, you can, you can see the history of that. Um, I think this is really important to know still today in that if you look at a uh, market share of web servers, I'll go back to history in a second. Um, you know, starting in 2004, 
we've now become the most popular web server out there. The rest of this conversation is not about web servers, by the way. We're, gonna, we're very focused on low balancing um, API gateways, uh, application security, and Nginx. Um, but it is the same software, right? So the same web server software can be configured to do reverse proxy load balancing. And it's the same software that can handle those, you know, millions of concurrent connections, depending on how your, your device is configured your, and your configuration goes. And uh, the reason for the market share, I would say, is because architects are confident this is the right ar solution for their projects. And, and that's the decline of everything else, right? We had the advantage of not being written in 1988. And at the time when, you know, the fastest processor was, you know, 100 megahertz or something, we came about in a time where, you know, multi-threaded processors were the norm. Uh, we still wanted to be efficient with memory because we wanted to handle tens of thousands of concurrent connections. Uh, and we are we're still today. Um, but then you, you get the idea. All right. So back to the history. Uh, as that market share is ramping up. We had more and more demand for support. And when we were founded, that was the only product was to offer support to our customers. 2013, we introduced a proprietary solution called Nginx Plus. A couple of great features in Nginx Plus that aren't in Nginx open source. We'll go through a few of them in detail on this call. Um, and in general, that was our main solution until 2017 when we introduced a new software to be the control plane of Nginx, the web server, and the load balancers, uh, creatively called Nginx Controller. Uh, fast forward to last year, required by F5, and a couple new releases. Actually, I, I meant to update this for we're on, we expect to release Nginx controller 3.7 today. So we're doing monthly releases and I've got five different slide decks and I forget to update, um, <laughs> you know, things like that that change every month. Um, yeah, anyway, I already talked about the market share and that is the last time I'll talk about the web server. The rest of today, we'll talk about uh, what you're seeing on this slide. Uh, at the top, you know, the control plane gives you visibility into your environments very good tool for both the NetOps admins that want to see what's going on specifically with that web application, as well as the DevOps teams if they're, you know, if you're going into the DevOps model where everyone's sharing this environment, new load balancers get, you know, deployed programmatically. Um, so very, very nice tool in order to both um, get visibility as well as do version control uh, of those configurations. Uh, we, we typically get called a Swiss Army Knife. I like to look at it as a platform, Nginx Plus, in that it can do many different things and simplify um, our lives as architects and admins. Right, so uh, first two I've already talked about, another really interesting use case for Nginx is as a content cache. So we have the ability to cache whatever, to, whatever content it is you want, whether that's JPEGs and you know, PNGs, which is fairly obvious, you know, static content, uh, JavaScript files. Uh, we also do video caching. And so as you, you know, cache things closer to the end users, your application becomes much, much faster. Um, this is well known. This is why Akamai exists or what, what, what they originally did to come to the market, right? Our solution is much more of a bring your own. And so you can save lots and lots of money over managed services like Akamai. Uh, that said, there's plenty of reasons why you still might want to use um, third party services, depending on your skill set and, uh, you know, what your business models are. Web application firewall, WAF, as I'll refer to it the rest of the time here, uh, is our latest and greatest solution. It's joint F5 and Nginx solution. We took the F5 advanced WAF um, intellectual property, baked it into a module in Nginx Plus, which allows us to get very granular um, 
security policies for individual applications and um, both and get that into a DevOps, you know, pipeline. I'll talk a, a little bit more about that in a second. Nginx unit, we won't talk about it all. I'll say it's an open source solution in order to run uh, web servers, web application servers, and concurrently multiple application, excuse me, polyglot application server. We have you know, multiple languages running concurrently on a single app server. Good. So I mentioned Nginx Plus is proprietary. Um, for everyone that joined the call today, we are offering you one year developer licenses. So um, after the call, Nick will send out an email with a link that you'll have in order to put in a, a code on our website and it will send you a, a specific keys for yourself. Uh, with that, you'll be able to use any of the features uh, you see listed here. We're actually, um, the lab itself is open source. So you can do a lot of that um, with this as well. So give you a couple, um, I, you know, use cases for where Nginx Plus really differentiates itself from open source. The first one is it's just mostly targeted towards, you know, larger enterprises that have security needs. You know, you want visibility into your east-west traffic and open source has got, um, I want to say six to 10 different, um, you know, variables that you can report to your log files and Nginx Plus has over 200, right? So when you're uh, concerned about security and you want a lot of visibility into what's happening with that application, it's almost a slam dunk for visibility alone. Uh, once you get deeper into what you can do with these modules though, uh, the developers get pretty excited when we have native um, JOT token authentication and OpenID Connect support for things like Okta, Ping, Azure AD, you know, whatever OpenID Connect um, you know, provider you're using uh, becomes, you know, very easy to put uh, these gateways very close to the environment and give the developers a lot of control over authentication. Uh, active health checks, you know, the difference between an active ha health check and passive is that a passive health check was caused by a user hitting the website and something was down. And then at that point we took that, you know, app server out of the pool and that user probably got a 500 error message. With active health checks, we can check on a lot of different things, pretty much anything, right? What's the status code that's being returned by each pool member? Um, we can have a health page that says what the specific health is of that app server, and including something that's doing a backend script to see what the CPU and memory utilization is like um, before we take it out of a pool. Uh, so again, every one of these features, because Nginx is fairly inexpensive, has driven a, a, an architect to adopt this technology in order to um, you know, help, help their needs. I'm gonna skip with the rest of the, of the plus features and simply say that, I know you can't click this link, I apologize for that. Um, if you go to Google anytime in the future and type in Nginx plus feature matrix, something along those lines, this is what you'll find and it's a, it's a great website in that it, you can click on a lot of the features. It'll tell you how to configure them um, and if it's an open source or not. And again, you're getting developer licenses for Nginx Plus, so I'd start there. It's a lot easier, um, but everything, everything's available. So um, this is the most exciting thing I've been a part of in a number of years, and that is a new product called Nginx App Protect, which is that WAF I mentioned earlier. There are other WAFs on the market and Nginx has actually had um, partnership with Mod Security and still does um, for those that are using it, uh, where uh, Mod Security uh, isn't meeting all needs and F5 is a great name in advanced WAF and gives us a lot more flexibility of where we position the WAF inside of an environment. And, um, if you look at your developers and your security architects and they want to secure east-west traffic, do we want that traffic going back up to a big IP at the perimeter or do we want to have it directly at the application level? 
Right? So those are decisions that you can start to make when you're up. So I didn't mention this earlier, but Nginx, the software is about 100 meg deployed. It depends on a few different modules and uh, variables, but uh, if you consider that most of the alternative solutions are in the gigabytes, uh, it gives you, again, the flexibility to put it anywhere, whether that's a Docker container, uh, physical infrastructure from Dell with 88 cores, it scales all the way up and all the way down. Um, and we will get into that within the workshop right, when, when we go hands-on. Um, and we'll even see all this security statistics in a uh, visualization tool called Elk. All right, so I mentioned earlier that we see Nginx App Protect closer to the code, right? And so this is where the application runs on the, on the right-hand side of this slide. And you can put App Protect very close to those applications and make the policies very granular for each one. Um, we'll talk more about what a Kubernetes ingress controller is in a minute. Um, we just released support for Nginx App Protect in front of Kubernetes um, about two weeks ago. So it's also uh, one of the more exciting things um, we have. At some point in the future, we'll have a workshop with one tech on specifically Kubernetes ingress controllers and the ability to configure um, policies for every one of those Kubernetes pods. Uh, but today we'll have a, a broad overview of how to, how to um, protect the application. As a matter of fact, it'll be more at this level, right? Where we create a Docker container to protect um, this Kubernetes ingress controller. All right. Let me talk a little bit more about why did F5 buy Nginx and why does that matter to anybody? So in we call this our code to customer slide. And this is a bunch of different areas of the application delivery path. And if you're like any organization that's been around for a while, there's probably a lot of different vendors that have been brought in to address specific needs of the application delivery, right? We wanna, we wanna secure it, we wanna make sure it's fast. Uh, we wanna mitigate denial of service. We also want to give high availability. We do load balancing an API gateway so we can secure the requests with JOT tokens and then new, new app server stuff with the ingress controllers. Right? And so if you look at this, there's a, this introduces a bunch of different problems. One, there's different skill sets that be, need to be maintained for each vendor's product. It gets expensive because every time you make an app change, you gotta figure out which one of these things needs to be upgraded to support those changes and the coordination between all of them. Excuse me, I skipped a slide. Between those teams, right? So you put a change control in for uh, app change down here all the way to the left and all of these teams that maintain expertise in those technologies need to be engaged. Uh, on, on top of all those issues is what impacts the actual performance to the end users, right? And all, every one of those hops introduces some level of latency and many of them are inefficient and slow. Right? And so when you look at what Nginx and F5 are doing together is to really simplify that application delivery path. And we already have a lot of developers that are probably using Nginx in various aspects of their application, potentially web servers today, right? And so there is already expertise with Nginx and there's probably a big IP in most of the environments that I'm sure that you guys are managing. And so we don't see big IP going away, right? It's um, virtual edition and all of the clouds. It's, you know, physical boxes where you need all the ultimate scalability on premises and it will continue to do perimeter security. There's absolutely no change there. Um, I've seen some great stories on how big IP is able to mitigate denial of service attacks better than devices that were intentionally designed to be security devices. Uh, whereas big IP was initially designed to be a load balancer, today it's an incredibly good security device or application, I should say. And so the perimeter security can continue to operate um, as it should with stable um, change control policies uh, and you know, probably two week windows to make modifications. 
while giving the app teams, you know, whatever they are, if they're doing DevOps or just regular developers implementing new applications with more modern architectures, can use these Nginx instances to give much more granular controls and potentially improve performance to their applications. Again, we're removing all of those um, vendors potentially from the app path and we interoperate with many of them. So don't, don't say it has to be all or nothing here. Um, but again, simplifying um, all, all those functions to two different software types. Before I move on, um, oh no, you know, we forgot to do the, the polls, Dominic. Can you launch the, Engin, um, the Nginx experience um, poll? Thanks. Um, and so if we just want to get a feel for your background, even though I should have asked you this a long time ago. Um, and then we've got another poll coming up in just a minute. Uh, and I'll try to help level set the conversation here. Okay. So yeah, we'll talk about Kubernetes in a second. In the meantime, uh, I mentioned the term API gateway a couple of different times, and I think it makes sense to define what Jesse means when I talk about an API, All right? And so an API is not when you go to a web browser and call up, you know, cd.com or chase.com, right? That is just a browser request. What is an API request? is basically everything else once the traffic is internal. So I'm gonna use the example of a financial website because we all have a bank account, we all have a credit card account with somebody. Um, so it makes for a pretty um, you know, understandable example here. So let's just say we're gonna log on to chase.com. We get the main frame of the website and you'll see these microservices, you know, quadrants of that application beginning to populate data. Like the first quadrant of that website might be the current balance that you've got with the bank. The next would be potentially the most recent statements that you've got. Another um, area of the, the page could be for um, other credit cards that they're offering for you know, advertisements, whatever it is, right? And so each one of those is kind of represented by these Nginx um, rectangles in the, in the microservices space here. And they could be many of them, right? And so that the current balance microservice has a specific app team and they, they manage the code for that app and all of those instances are being load balanced by an upstream Nginx instance, right? And so, and one of the things that they'll do is talk to the other microservices in the environment. And they do that with JOT requests. Modern architectures are doing um, REST JSON calls. So REST, for those of you who don't, um, haven't heard that term a lot, is basically a call to a backend web service that can be completely understood by a single request, right? So we're, we're giving it the authentication, we're asking for specific data with whatever variables it needs in order to give us that data, right? So it's, it's um, very compact requests and then the JSON payload is basically key value pairs for every all the data pieces that are being returned back to the requester. Or in, that, in that case, the client is an app server. So that's the definition of an API from our perspective at Nginx. Okay. Uh, one second. Oh, we're good. So they're very important. APIs are generally, um, you know, incredibly valuable to their organizations, right? So if you're Chase and, you know, you've got a mobile application, every user that's using that mobile application, all the requests going back to the, the data center are via API requests. Right? And so those need to obviously be secured. Um, if you think of other apps that you use on your phone, it would be, um, for example, Marriott. So when you're trying to find a hotel, in Manhattan and you're going to the map to get the specific location, that's using a Google map API, right? And Google monetizes that to all those businesses that embed it, right? And so we're, number one needs to be secure. Number two needs to be very fast. So those, you know, requests load quickly. 
Um, and many of those, you know, examples here are using Nginx in the background. Certainly um, Dropbox, Expedia, a whole bunch of very, very large websites, including some very small websites. So again, it scales up very high and very low. API management is the ability to manage those APIs that you've got in your environment, right? So it's the control plane of the API environment. Nginx um, has an API management solution and it is very different from the API management solutions in the market in, in general, right? And so the traditional method is to put the control plane in front of the data plane. So I have a chain link right here. And the problem with this model that we've, we see at Nginx is that every request takes more time to process by that control plane before its response is sent to the client. You know, as I said earlier, we, Nginx scales really well. We're also very fast with our responses. So the lowest latency API gateway around and our control plane is out of path with the data plane, which gives a couple of different advantages. One would be it doesn't have this extra processing done at the control plane layer for every single request. Number two is that these data planes, these API gateways can be distributed all over the world and not need to have uh, you know, constant communication with the control plane. Control plane is only needed for reporting and for sending out new configurations to the data plane. So more relevant to what we'll be doing in the lab today is Kubernetes, right? And so the, the workshop will be deploying an application to a Kubernetes cluster, and then we protect it with Nginx app protect. Uh, just to get a feel for where everyone is with um, Kubernetes, if we launch that poll, Dominic. Thank you. And get the results. Not at all. Okay, so we, uh, that, um, very common, by the way. I, I, I never assume that any particular organization is using Kubernetes today, so let's start at a very high level. Um, before we even talk about where Nginx fits in a Kubernetes environment. So we meant, we talked about, um, well, we haven't talked about it yet. Let's talk about a retail website on Black Friday, right? So they have a ton of load compared to let's just say Christmas day, right? When no one's shopping because they're all getting fat at the dinner table, right? But on Black Friday, they need all these additional virtual machines to meet the customer's demand. When we do that in the cloud, all those virtual machines that are running are giving some hourly cost back to that retail website. And so in order to orchestrate the spinning up and spinning down of those virtual machines, I'm in this example, we need something to do that. And that thing is Kubernetes. Now, Kubernetes is specifically doing this with uh, containers. And so these containers are all basically running in pods um, that all do the same service. So back to the microservices example, you know, this is the um, current balance microservice. And you can see that it's got three different pods running that, and it could be hundreds or it could be one, but the idea is there, there's a service. And as that scales up, we need something to be able to route to the pod that's responding the fastest. We're not sending all of the load to the first one, right? And so the thing that does that is a Kubernetes ingress controller. Nginx is actually the default Kubernetes ingress controller, but there's a couple flavors of the ingress controller to be aware of. And the first being the default that comes with a Kubernetes environment when you install from scratch, right? And that is based on Nginx, but it is not the Nginx, the company, and F5 is the company's solution, right? They're just making a fork from our mainstream Kubernetes or Nginx instance, and they're adding some specific Kubernetes hooks into it. F5 Nginx has a open source Kubernetes ingress controller that adds functionality on top of what the Kubernetes community is doing here on the left. 
And the Nginx Plus brings it all together with all the plus features that I was talking about earlier, as well as uh, what you were seeing on the slide in terms of a Helm repository and the ability to do custom resources. It's got native modules, so requests are processed much, much faster. If you look at things that are probably needed like JOT token authentication, um, all those things are built into the Nginx Plus Kick, right? So Kubernetes ingress controller, we call it Kick. Um, and the cool thing is that it's all, all our documentation is available on GitHub and Nginx Inc, you can see is our handle, right? So everything you see in GitHub under Nginx Inc is maintained by F5 and there's some pretty good examples of how to configure an ingress controller and in, in general, um, Nginx altogether, not just for Kubernetes. So is there any other poll, Dominic, that we should have launched? I think that's about right. Oh, we'll get to the last one. I, I, I see it. Uh, all right, before uh, we go to the workshop, I think, like I said earlier, it makes sense to understand what the goals are. And I'm gonna do a quick demo. In the demo, let's see my windows here, sorry. You know what, I'm gonna click on this just to get the documentation. You don't need to log in the UDF yet, but um, if you're multitasking, it doesn't hurt to um, click the join button on there now. Matter of fact, let's just, let's just let's do that. So um, for anyone that hasn't got the invitation to UDF yet, please let us know. Um, in the chat window, I'll just send all panelists your email address and we'll add you in. And then once you're in there, go ahead and click on the, the launch button. It'll bring you to this screen where you can continue. And this will always be here, so you don't need to worry about what I'm doing exactly, but um, you've got documentation and deployment. The deployment is what's going to spin up for the next couple of minutes. Right, there's this Windows jump post that takes probably three or four minutes and that's the main thing you're gonna need to use. So it doesn't hurt to kick that off right now. All right, but main, main thing I wanna show you right now is the architecture of this application that we're going to be deploying and then securing. Right, and that's in our documentation. This documentation is available um, publicly, yeah, right? So you, don't you can actually clone this on GitHub if you wanted it. And we'll continue to maintain it as we progress with versions of, of the lab and Nginx, or excuse me, the uh, Nginx App Protect container. So here's our fictitious financial services website. The color coding is for each of the microservices behind that application, right? And so you can, can you think about having a specific development team that's responsible for each component or each colored section of this application. The goal of the lab will be to protect this and to, be, and to understand um, that you could have different WAF policies for each one of these microservices, right? And so the problem with a WAF is that you can create false positives because the developers actually need to make calls that look suspicious, right? And so, having the highest security um, policy for every component of a website is problematic, especially when you have a portion of the website that's like training docs or documentation in general, right? No need to bother with worrying about SQL injection potentially in that section of the application. And so we, we leave a no WAF policy for that. I'm just making up examples here. Uh, whereas when you're transferring money to friends, you wanna make sure that those requests are legitimately made through your, your web client. And so that's, that's the architecture of the appli application here. I'll walk you through UDF a little bit too, in that we have our friend, my friend and yours, Matthew Dierick, who walks through um, a lot of the different sections of this lab, right? And so um, if you get hung up, Number one, we're gonna be around for the next, I wanna say hour and a half after we start 
the workshop. So happy to do one-on-one -on -one sessions with anyone that gets stuck somewhere. Um, or you can watch our friend here on YouTube go through the example as well. Right? He's, he's, he is French, but he has a very light accent and he wrote the workshop. So I'm grateful for, uh, to him for doing that. Um, one other thing I kind of glossed over is I clicked through about four or five different pages of kind of detailing the steps of the workshop. And it, it said one of the uh, steps you're gonna do is deploy the application, but it didn't give you a command to run. If you don't see the command, it's not time to run it yet. When you get to the point where you need to run a command, it will tell you that command and you'll be able to copy and paste that into the lab environment. That's what we're going to do right now, actually. So it's saying to SSH, not use WebSSH, which is a modification. We are going to use WebSSH because it's much, much easier. Um, there's a couple different tweaks that you'll need to do, and we're gonna leave that on the main screen here during uh, the hands-on portion so you don't need to worry about remembering what I'm about to say. So back to our UDF. You can see green arrows on all of our instances. I'm actually logged into that jump host right now that I'm running this presentation from. So you can see that I've got a couple of different windows here. And this is the main browser window that when you launch will show up. Um, so after you click on, hold on. Yes, the recording will absolutely be available. Um, we will ha we'll send it out probably tomorrow morning um, based on past experience with getting them out quickly, trying to get them out quickly. All right, so let me, let me go back to, this is your UDF environment. And to go to the jump host, I would actually recommend clicking on details. Oops, where, where am I? Okay, access, there we go and pick a resolution, right? Whether, whether or not you wanna do full screen or put it in a window, that's entirely up to you. And then I'm, I'm currently running on a window. Once you do that, I would click on Chrome just to get it spun up and then um, let that run. Once you've done that, then you wanna go back to UDF and then go to the documentation and kind of scroll through the steps and you wanna to get to the point where you're on module three, and then we start copying and pasting these commands. And so it says to log in to this CICD server, and I'll show you what that looks like. So CICD at the top here, we wanna do access, and we are going to click on web shell. You see that SSH is actually disabled because I haven't loaded a public key. Uh, for those of you who like public keys, you're welcome to load your own in, but you do not need that. So I have a web shell here and I'm gonna make it bigger so hopefully everyone can see. And the, the steps that aren't in the lab guide but we will post on the presentation here is to switch users to the Ubuntu user and then switch directories to the home directory. Right From there you can see all the files that we'll be using um, for this example. And if you're using Windows, when we do the paste, you'll wanna do Control, Shift, hold those both down and press V. All right, so it's not just Control V to paste, you need Control, Shift, V. Again, all that will be in the help guide. I'm gonna do that right now. So this command is running kubectl. Right, so a couple things. One, don't need to follow along with me. Um, in your own lab. Main thing you want to do is click on UDF and click on spin up the lab and then watch my screen so you get a feel for what you will be doing because this will probably take you an hour. So thank you, Dominic, for letting me know the question on that. Thumbs up. All right, uh, I'm trying to make this a little bit smaller so you can see what's going on. All right, so I ran the command, it's kubectl, you can't see the beginning of it. We, we applied a file that's here, right? And it's all apps. If I look at that, which is gonna be a little hard to read on the resolution I've got. 
Um, oh, I see it's in the directory. Arcadia. Oh, okay. So um, Kubernetes uses what's called YAML files in order to do configurations. This is a, a manifest that tells Kubernetes what to do when we apply this configuration. Right? And just to give you a high level overview, you, this, in this lab, there's a lot of different technologies that we're using. Um, I think the main thing to understand is Kubernetes is the thing that's orchestrating these containers, right? It's going to apply this configuration, which is to download this Docker uh, image from this registry, which is on GitLab, which is publicly available if anyone wants to steal it, and then deploy it to this cluster on port 80. Okay, and so once that's done, you can do a kubectl get pods and you can see that it's running the pods for this application. We can't get there yet because we first need to deploy the ingress policy that tells the, all the traffic coming into the Kubernetes cluster where those services are, right? And so the next command is to deploy the ingress controller, and I'm going to do it just out of memory here. Uh, it's ingress, full ingress. Okay, so that is running. If you go back to your jump host and you click on the Arcadia tab, or actually you may even open a new tab and click on Arcadia Kubernetes, it will launch that website. If you do that ahead of time, you'll see that it does not work. As a matter of fact, while we're here, we're going to send a script to it and see what happens. And it read the script and didn't do anything. It didn't block it, right? That's, that's the main key takeaway that you should see here. So the next step in the lab will be to protect this application from um, requests like I just did. To do that, um, we're just building a Docker image. You're not going to use this tool that I'm showing on the screen. I'm using this tool simply to show you what your Docker container is doing. Right? So Docker containers are built from what's called a Docker file, very creatively named, and that tells it what Linux instance to start with and then it starts installing some features that's needed for that particular service. In the case of Nginx App Protect, uh, we're just doing some real basic uh, Linux um, fundamentals and then installing App Protect, right? So this is the main line within this Docker file that said on this CentOS 7.4 image, install the Nginx App Protect application and it found it using this um, repo. The only thing that's required is that the Nginx um, certificates are in this root folder. Um, like I said, for all of you, uh, they'll get one year developer licenses. So you can run Nginx app protect on your laptop against your own Kubernetes cluster. Um, that's all available to you. And these Docker files are also available on our GitHub. So none of this is, um, you know, all of it can be taken away with you. So the, the build of the Docker file does take a good amount of time. You can see as I give it a name here that it will start downloading um, some packages from the internet, you know, both from the uh, Docker repo for the um, CentOS image, and then it's going to download Nginx App Protect from the Nginx repo. I've already done that because we're not here to watch um, a Docker file, file build. And the next step will be to run that. So we build an image and we can see the images that are available by doing a Docker space image space list or LS. And you can see that that image is right here. And that's the first one we created. There's three different versions inside of this lab. One is without 
signatures. The second one has signatures. You can see a different repo that we, we download those signatures from. And the other one has um, what's called threat campaigns. Those are what um, F5 Labs develops in order to get a 100% hit rate without any false positives on current attacks that are going on on the internet. Those are included with the Nginx App Protect license. I'm not here to talk about licensing at all, um, but just to say that they are included always with other solutions. So really good feature for uh, protecting your applications and not worrying about any uh, false positives that will be introduced by bringing in WAF to that environment. So with that, we're going to run one of these containers and I am going to simply um, find the command that I ran previously, which is docker run. Uh, we're gonna run it as a daemon and give it a name. It's gonna run on port 80 and it's gonna pass this nginx.conf file to the nginx comp file within that Docker container, right? And so if you go into the directory tree here, you can see that this is the nginx comp file, very basic configuration, right? We're telling where to send the logs to, uh, what log format to use and what the policy will be that we're applying to this Docker container for this particular microservice. And then this is the upstream web server that we're protecting. Right, and so as soon as you would deploy this Docker container, you would prevent this public website from being accessible to the world. Instead, you'd point your you know, www.finance.com to the Docker container as opposed to the backend website. So anyway, I'm gonna run that in a second after, you show you, after I show you that this is a real demo. Right, and so there's a link, a uh, favorite in the toolbar here that's Arcadia, nginx app protect docker if i click that i'm running a container no wait a minute this isn't cache isn't it there you go okay so truly it is not running um and i'm going to click reload so you'll trust me all right so now i'm going to run this it will take a second to load um, now you can do a docker ps and you can see that we've got this new app protect with threat campaigns running and if i go back to my browser i click reload It does take a second, by the way. Um, it's not instant we to get that image up and running. And then we're gonna log in and you can see we're, we're back to that application. All right, and so we got the, we haven't blocked the main one we were using earlier, but you can see that this is the script that we were using. And I'm gonna pass the same thing to our new Arcadia Nginx app protect instance. And if I do that question mark script, you can see it blocked the request. And this is Nginx at Protect blocking it. It isn't anything else, right? So um, this request was logged with this support ID and then sent to a visualization tool. And that visualization tool is called Kibana. And for those of you not familiar with Elk, it's a, um, a stack of um, programs that combine to visualize your log data, right? So it's uh, elastic search to be able to search through your logs. Um, this log stash component that makes the data readable by the database engine and then stores it in elastic search. And Kibana is the thing that allows you to kind of get a, a nice dashboard of what's being going, going on in the application. So you can see if I run this um, dashboard, the requests going into um, that environment. You can see what happened and why with each of those requests. You can see the first request we did was okay. And then the next one uh, above it is the legal characters in the parameter, attack signature detected and we blocked it, right? And so very good details as to what's going on in your logs. And then we have the ability to kind of give a nice little dashboard for your network operation center. And it's not gonna have a whole lot of data in it because it's a lab, but you can see what we just did. This is the red line is that um, script we sent that was blocked. And the green one is the stuff that was um, accepted because it didn't have any um, issues with it. So all this again is available within the lab. You can go ahead and create new dashboards. 
um, fiddle around with the whole thing. This is an open environment. Um, you can actually download Visual Studio Code and run it if, if you're familiar with that tool. If you're not familiar with Visual Studio Code, totally recommend using it in the future next time you're modifying any sort of script or um, application. That said, if you haven't used it prior to this lab, not something that I would recommend doing. Just follow the instructions and you'll, you'll just use the putty windows and stuff like that. Um, all right, so we are at the point where, uh, let me see what was in the last slide. Hold on one second. One, okay, one last thing I'll say before you we, we end the presentation portion and go completely into the lab. It's a couple terminology mappings that are different between um, NGINX, NGINX Plus, and F5, right? So I understand uh, most of us probably come from a big IP world. Uh, the main thing, um, actually this doesn't come too much into this lab, but the main thing to know is that when uh, you look at what's called upstream in this NGINX config, um, that's a pool member. Um, and so actually this isn't even using a, uh, upstream. So skip that, apologize. Let's launch that um, survey for potential future workshops if it makes sense um, and see what people are interested in. Unless the questions aren't relevant, Dominic, then I'll leave that judgment to you. Um, in the meantime, I'm going to leave this slide up with the instructions for uh, what's different in the lab versus um, the lab guide, right? So the main one is just being the switch user to Ubuntu. This is all lowercase, I'll correct that in a second. And then hit CD and it'll bring you to the home directory. Um, so use web shell. Uh, do that switch user command. And is there anything else I'm missing? Otherwise, I'll say thank you very much for um, you know attending today. Uh, really hope you get something out of the demo and in the subsequent lab. We'll be around for at least another hour, hour and seven minutes, I think it is, um, if you run into issues. And also, um, you know, if you don't get through it today and you want to go through it again. Just reach out to Nick at One Tech, and we will uh, schedule a session for you. It has to be some time window. Uh, 12 hours is the maximum we can spin these labs up for with our system. Uh, but happy to do that um, if you do run out of time today and it's of value to you. Awesome. Uh, so thank you all very much. Well, uh, let us know if you have any issues with the lab.